Okay, I just um, w was asked to participate in this panel discussion and I just put together a few slides on what I see as the differences which I hope maybe will get us started. So uh, the, maybe one of the most important differences is, is that most, almost all of the US, we would say we have mixed heating and cooling loads and then many commercial buildings are cooling dominant. So uh, we have significant heating, cooling and dehumidification loads and I'd say in general uh, we, we think of as Sweden as having low cooling loads so I think cooling of residences is becoming slightly more common. Uh, commercial buildings, of course, you have mixed heating and cooling, but the um, the um, uh, you know the predominant situation is uh, heating loads only, and so in one sense it's trivial, but I think it actually explains a lot of the differences. Um, so the heat pumps in the U.S. are mostly dual function; they heat and they cool. Okay. There's very few that also do water heating, although uh, you know, everything I'm going to say there's probably exceptions exceptions to. Uh, cl Climate Master in the U.S. has a, a, a triple function a product now that does water heating also. Most of the heat pumps, ground source heat pump systems use water to air heat pumps. And generally, uh, we, for, we enjoy a rich amount of data, so, you know, 100 to 200 data points for every heat pump, which makes my life as a uh, someone who, you know, with design software that models the effects and makes it somewhat easier. Um, in Scandinavia, most the heat pumps are also mostly dual function, but they're dual heating and water heating. Actually means both kind of heat pumps have a valve, you know, automatic valve for, in one case it's reversing, the other case it's to switch between the heating system, house heating system, the water heating. But they're mostly water to water heat pumps. Um, for ground source that I'm talking about, of course. And I'll say, in general, the data has been not so available, although I believe that's a changing. I'm looking at Martin here, who's gonna nod that yes, it's better than it was. Okay, in terms of the systems, the other difference we see is that for the most part in the US, the predominant commercial building system is uh, what I would call distributed heat pumps. So we, from the ground heat exchanger, even, uh, we, well, we, we often have a central ground heat exchanger with multiple boreholes, but connected to a number of heat pumps that are spread out in the building. So if it was this building, we might have one heat pump here somewhere just serving this space, another heat pump serving, you know, the rooms down the hall and so on. In Scandinavia, it's a, a more situation having central heat pumps than distributing the uh, heat with uh, panel radiators or for cooling, maybe chilled beams or something, or fan coil units. But but the, the, it's more like a central plant that provides hot, or hot water and maybe chilled water in general, right? In terms of hybrid systems, um, or, uh, sometimes called bivalent or there's other names, but in the U.S., the most common situation is that we have to, for commercial buildings, we have to reject excess heat. Uh, so we have cooling towers or fluid coolers. Um, here the situation is the opposite. It was discussed earlier the, uh, uh, by Joachim Clausen that the, the um, systems are designed, residential systems are designed to use some backup electric resistance heating. And I think he said it used to be 50% of the peak load would be met by uh, the heat, the vapor compression cycle. Now it's more like 70%. But of course, in the US and the northern US, we also use this uh, backup electric resistance heating. So that's actually, that's just my short view. I've already talked about the difference between ground heat exchangers this morning with groundwater filled and grouted, but I, I thought at least that would get us started is what I see some of the differences and our panelists can chime in where I'm wrong or, or what it may, may, may come out exceptions and that kind of thing, but that, that I just thought it was quick getting us started. So, Thank you, Professor Spittler. I would like to invite the rest of the panel and I will take the chance to introduce the ones that have not been presenting today. So, Tony Jernstrom, please join us here. Uh, Tony is a uh, Con drilling contractor and a representing even an energy company uh, here in Sweden, uh, utilities uh, company. So he's uh, experienced for a couple of decades and uh, he has been also traveling to the US in the last years for uh, this networking interaction through ICSPA and among others. Uh, I would also like to welcome Dr. Hatef Madani, 
uh, he's a assistant professor at the Department of Energy Technology. He's, he made his PhD in capacity control heat pump systems, uh, or specifically ground source heat pump systems, and he's our expert right now in heat pumps and heat pump simulations. Uh, professor Marco Fossa from the University of Genoa in Italy. He's uh, been uh, doing lots of research on modeling of bo multiple borehole fields. Specifically, he's been publishing a lot about the ASHRAE method, which is one of the approaches uh, often used in the United States. And uh, John Turley, that you have already listened to, so I think I skip presenting more about John, uh, president of the board of directors, and of course, Professor Spittler. So, uh, Jan Eric, would you like to join us up here? So, <clears throat> one question we one question we ask us here is Jeff and John. Uh, how does the geothermal source heat pump industry in the U.S. perceive the investments that some Swedish companies have made recently in the U.S.? Can you say anything about that? John, I think this one's for you. So uh, you're, you're speaking specifically of uh, multiple Swedish companies or just NIBE? Uh, Movitech and... Oh, Movitech, yeah. And okay. uh, NIBE has right. made... Them. NIBE has bought the water furnace and the Movitech is moving in with a lot of plastic, maybe. Uh, we should let... Uh, um, what about uh, Pope Borning or...? Mr. Uh, <laughs> plastic <Okay>. Pipe. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Can you come up here too? Yeah, so would you like to join the panel? Join the panel, so we can have you too. Um, how, from the American side, have you seen any reaction from, let's say, American deliverers of such equipment, which are negative or interested or, or positive to interference by Swedish vendors? Uh, I'll tell you my reaction to it. And earlier I mentioned our federal tax credits and the prospect that they may end. And a lot of our domestic, our, our U.S. industry has been fixated on what will happen to the industry when these end. Meanwhile, we've had uh, over the last few years, of course, Bosch bought Florida Heat Pump and Nebo bought three of our largest manufacturers. And we have companies like Movitech coming in, it excites me. And it excites me because these are very smart people making these investments. And obviously, they're far enough removed from our negativity over losing federal tax credits that they see an opportunity here. And so I personally uh, see it as very positive. The second uh, part of that is, apart from the manufacturers, when we see uh, companies coming in with new heat exchanger product, products or materials, whether they be concentric or new. Uh, we've seen uh, polyethylene with flex of uh, aluminum or graphite, etc. I think the ground heat exchanger is the uh, what we call the low-hanging fruit for improvements in our systems right now. Uh, the heat pump manufacturers have kept up with with developing their technology for many, many years. I th in the U.S., we're still putting polyethylene U-tubes down holes and uh, grouting them with bentonite at times. So I think the prospect of new ideas coming in for the heat exchangers rep represents a great opportunity to lower that first cost that we've talked about several times today and see wider deployment. Yeah. Do you have any reactions, Jeff? Uh, I don't think I'm as probably as well connected with everyone in the industry as John, but uh, I haven't heard it. I've, you know, I haven't heard any kind of negative reaction. Oh, it's owned by Swedes, so we don't want to buy this anymore. So it's, mm -hmm. it, you know, there's a lot of interest in just what's happening in the industry and. In, in fact, I was, if I, I don't know if I'm allowed to then pass a question on, but I'd really like to hear from Martin if he sees yep. any opportunities mm -hmm. to yep. bring U.S. technology. Because I, I know when I've talked to 
uh, Bosch and even uh, FHP before the you know the kind of answer I got back was well no really we think you know the heat pumps are kind of different and you know they really didn't think there'd be any kind of cross pollinization you know it was just kind of well it's interesting but we do things differently so I was wondering if you had any other thoughts on it as to what is yeah. whether well, what can we learn from the Swedes. <laughs> Well, I guess uh, we will have to um, to look into that. What I mean, I'm I don't know our American companies that well yet. I have to admit. However, I know that my colleagues down from Mercury they have been over to Anatech. Anatech is the company that we have been uh, working with together for the longest time, and it's exactly the same comment that I've heard from them. Well. We've been there, we've seen it, it's different. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm quite sure that there are things, I, I'm, I'm convinced that we will learn a whole lot from you. And I think that this um, exchange of technologies will have to be implemented um, carefully, not to step on too many people's toes, uh, because that can stop the collaboration um, uh, however, I know that uh, the, the company that I work for have always been working in that way that they leave their companies that they acquire pretty much alone. And that they just try to help. They're not forcing the companies to adopt uh, technology. ways of thinking and ways to administrate. In the long run, I think uh, this is, uh, this is um, a necessity to survive because um, I am convinced that our technology, not only ground source heat pumps, but the heat pump technology as a whole, that's the future. And there will be a change. I don't know in, in what time frame, but there will be a change of paradigm going from combustion heating over to more efficient uh, heat pump technologies. There will be a change and then we will see a huge consolidation worldwide. Only the biggest and the strongest will survive. And now is the time to position yourself, to be in a position where you can survive in the long run. And then you have to be strong and you have to be active on many different markets. And of course, obviously, the US is an enormous and interesting market. So, Adib, how do you perceive it to be in America? Is it the land of, of glory and, and, and honey, or <laughs> what is it? First of all, I think in order to to answer this question, it would be better if uh, Kari Oyala uh, would come here yeah. and answer okay. the question, or uh, from there, uh, probably he could answer the question, because yeah. he is most uh, relevant person to answer. But I can add also <laughs> one thing this, uh, to the table of the uh, um, Professor Spittler, from the uh, technical point of view also, uh, the heat exchanger that we produce in United States uh, mostly they are SDR11 and even SDR9. But in they are adapted to the American way of it. Yes, yeah. and here we, in a Scandinavian country, we mostly produce in SDR17 and in the uh, central of Europe, uh, SDR11. But I never uh, I have seen any SDR9. And this means that we have a much thicker wall thickness and the, the efficiency of the uh, heat transfer in the so whole system. Do you have a thicker wall thickness here or in America? In America. In America, I Yes. Mm -hmm. And the other uh, differences is uh, from the material point of view. In Here in Europe, we are not allowed to use a master batch in order to add the carbon black in the raw material in order to produce the pipe. Tomorrow, 
perhaps we will uh, talk a little bit about the carbon black and the role of the carbon black in order to uh, UV protection. But in US, uh, there is another uh, things that uh, uh, many uh, pipe manufacturer or there is no any restriction to uh, to do that, and they usually uh, buy the natural color material, and then they add uh, some additives and antioxidant, and I also uh, the uh, carbon black. Yeah, in, in I the, understand. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I would like to say that if anybody in the audience has a question here, uh, Jose will take it. So wave in that case if you have a question and Jose will come to you and if many have the same questions Jose will ask it uh, later. Uh, the, the will make a synthesis of the questions but that you might have. If 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 you want to come back to your question uh, may I ask Carrie if you if you would like yeah. to yeah. would he like yeah come up here and tell can't you cut? Can you sit there? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> yeah. um, Marco and Jeff. In Sweden and Europe in general, many companies use design software used, uh, using G functions that account for thermal interaction between boreholes. In the US, you have a design tradition based on the so-called ASHRAE method. Uh, must the ASHRAE method be used for designing boreholes in the US, or are other methods allowed as well? Um, okay. Uh, I mean multiple boreholes now, a borehole field or something yeah, like that. Yeah, no, the ASHRAE method is not required by, there, I don't think there's any codes anywhere it's, if you read the handbook closely, I mean, it's given as an example procedure. Um, it, uh, you know, but it also mentions the other the G function based procedures and, and so on are actually mentioned in the handbook. Um, if see, what, what can I say in a public forum here? It's, uh, I, I, you know, I recently we published a paper recently showing that the ASHRAE method, as appears in the handbook, doesn't work all that well, and um, uh, there's a couple. We compared it to some real systems and trying to predict what, based on what actually happened with the peak temperatures, what size they should be, see how it compares to the size they actually are, and. Um, there's some limitations with the, the, the three pulses that it uses in particular. Uh, I think Marco could also talk about the temperature penalty part. Um, but it's six in the handbook for several reasons. People like to have some kind of hand method that can actually be explained. I, I wouldn't want to have to present either the multipole method or G function superposition in the handbook for engineers to go out and, and program. So, uh, you know, and it's a committee decision. So. Marco, can you subscribe to that? Yeah, and thank you for, for inviting me to talk about G functions and, uh, and uh, the ASHRAE methods in, in, in a place where many, many people uh, uh, made re great research before me. And I mentioned, I'm, I'm thinking to, to Professor Spittler, but not only to, to him, people from Lund University or, or, or Chalmers University. Um, what I can s um, give as a contribution to this uh, discussion is that, for example, in, in Italy, we, we, we are regarding the, the design procedure. We are we are in between the the, 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 the Swedish and the U.S. tradition since uh, we we adopted the, the ASHRAE standard for designing b b the borehole fields. But our standard, it's, it's a national standard, uh, also um, allows the, the use of different methods based on, for example, the superposition of, uh, of uh, basic solutions, let's say G functions, based on uh, the knowledge of the monthly heat loads uh, at buildings at the building side. Side. Um, I started to, to work and, and to be interested in, in the ASHRAE methods, starting uh, um, reading uh, papers by by Jeffrey and uh, Professor Michel Bernier in uh, by the um, Polytech in Montreal, and um, and we started to work uh, um, since. Uh, we, we we had we had read that uh, 
mm, the ASHRAE method has uh, limitations in, in, uh, in uh, providing uh, real, reliable predictions uh, related to the uh, required length of a borehole field. But um, the, the, what is f fascinating uh, to me and, and very interesting from, uh, from a technical and engineering point of view is that uh, potentially the Yashrai method, which is based on, on just three, three heat passes describing the, the, the whole um, thermal history of a building uh, toward, uh, toward the, the, the ground, uh, is that uh, the, the ASHRAE method can be implemented in, in simple calculation tools like spreadsheets, while the, the G-function superposition, superposition needs uh, necessarily a, a dedicated code to, to perform the, the quite complicated calculations. And um, th there, are, there are a number of uh, literature um, mm, papers that uh, describes, uh, uh, let's say, alternative methods in order to improve uh, the ASHRAE method itself. And uh, those uh, methods, including um, a new one that uh, we have developed uh, also um, thanks to, 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 to the work of a, of a very clever uh, PhD student of mine, uh, David Rolando, who is here now as KTH, I'm happy uh, about that. Is working in a great uh, uh, research group, uh, and uh, we, we we believe that we we have found a a, a, a way that uh, can uh, that allow the the DSRI method to to be employed for giving uh, real, reliable results. Uh, comparable to those ones that can, that can be obtained uh, with uh, uh, G-function superposition at uh, monthly uh, at monthly level in, in terms of time step. Mm -hmm. Of course, the, 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 there, are, there are a number of, still a number of problems. One is related to the fact that the ASHRAE method is, uh, is based on a 10-year horizon. So are we really interested in just uh, making predictions at a 10-year horizon? Probably not. In, fa in fact, usually predictions and simulations are, are made uh, uh, for 25 years and this is a part that uh, it, it has to be exploited in order to, to, to make m m more and more interesting the, the ASHRAE method yeah. itself. Okay. And uh, the other, the other sp aspect is, is uh, one of uh, the, 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 the discussed in recent paper by, by Jeffrey is that uh, uh, we need to, to, to be able to, to um, correctly translate uh, the, the, the monthly heat loads uh, uh, calculated at the building side and uh, especially uh, its uh, peak uh, uh, value uh, into the um, simple three peak, uh, uh, three pulses, three pulse scheme yeah. of the Ashrine method. Thank you very much. It was a very Full answer. <laughs> um, Hotev and Jeff. Uh, Jeff has sometimes, according to to Jose at least, um, cl cl said that it's hard to come by uh, figures of how good this, how the Swedish heat pumps works. It is not so simple to find it. And you said that in the US it's very easy to find each manufacturer how their products work. Hotef, do you agree with him? That is hard to find figures from Swedish manufacturers. Maybe it's better that you explain about that, like how how you get the access and then how how, how extensive the, is that one and Yeah, the. Um, if I could just come to oh, this, yeah, come, yeah. no, come right here for a second. Yeah. The situation's changed. I found out from uh, re recently, but a few years ago, this is an example of uh, the data available for a U.S. heat pump here, and I've literally cut off. There are 66 data points with different combinations of entering water temperature and flow rate, and then there's uh, corrections for different air side flow rates and for using antifreeze. There are 50 data points and, and the corrections again for air side flow and antifreeze. So we could make a fairly good performance map of a typical uh, US heat pump. And this is uh, the typical situation. Go to Climate Master's website and you can download this data. I <coughs> use it a lot. Um, I, I've just been provided a, a few weeks ago a different, another example, some better data from NEBA, but uh, 
it used to be that this is all I could find on the website. And uh, I, I one time got some data from an industry insider who I won't name, but who gave me kind of a, a uh, anonymous, you know, a little bit larger set of data, which was very helpful. I greatly appreciate that. Um, but uh, only recently, I've got a uh, GLHE Pro user out in the room. Where's Kylina at? Oh, there she is, who said, oh yes, you can get this data. And she sent me, sent me some plots for a NEVA heat pump. So that's, it's actually improved from what I can tell, but that's the, uh, that, that's what I was referring to, so. So I, I, I can, some, uh, to some extent, I can agree that it's in a web page or just in the data sheet that is communicated with the customer. Usually that's not the case. But when it comes to uh, research, I can say as a research, we all, I mean like we have, we have close collaboration with the industry and then they are much more open to what they have. But then, uh, then the question would be that is like, uh, what is useful for the customer? Is that if, we, if the customer gets such a table, is that how informative is this to the customer? So it, it also depends on the target group that we have. So if it comes to the customer, probably it's better to communicate the seasonal performance factor. And then what, 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 what would be more interesting for the customer is that how much, like uh, in a normal case, more or less will, will pay for such a system. So it's like, yeah, so seeing not the unit, the whole system is one important thing probably that should be communicated with the customer. So not the unit efficiency, the system efficiency. And the second thing I think that is also important is that uh, just somehow communicate to the customer how much in the end should pay for that one. And then, then would be very easy because I think that heat pump has a say in that one because it's in the end the customer will earn a lot from having a heat pump so so basically giving more information on the annual base or life cycle base would be very useful to me yeah. actually okay thank you uh so can give uh, yeah. tony he okay. doesn't What's the that. next question <laughs> yes. to him i have a <laughs> technical device here yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah i can see that fantastic well tony <clears throat> you have been planning to establish uh, some kind of business in the u.s can you tell us a bit more about that and um what is your view as a contractor of working in the u.s well uh, i think so also to be able to speak here and uh, we listened on Martin uh, when they decided to go to the States and America they were sitting at the big board multi-billion dollar company and decided I think in my group I, I represent the, the small companies um, and I have a lot of colleagues there and I have a new colleague over there hello Dom uh, small companies and, and I think in, in uh, so I'm talking about myself and the people around me. And I think this journey with thinking about America, that was almost like for me being, um, I used to when I was young, I lived abroad and now I have been in Sweden 21 years, 51 years old and 100 kilo. <laughs> uh, I need to do an adventure. So I had a dream and that is to, uh, to look around the corner and our relatives, a lot of our, uh, in, in, in the audience, the Swedish, we have relatives that went west hundreds of years. And all the, our American friends, they had relatives coming from east. Uh, and uh, in, in their case, they maybe had to do a new job. The, the good thing is with us, we are, we are very good at our technology. We have good colleagues, we have a good network. So we can actually do this thing. And can we do it abroad? Yes, we have seen that today. So um, that dream is coming closer and, and before I, I retire I want to have an adventure myself. And happily like one third of the people around me are interesting as well. So we are a couple of small companies but we are very happy that Nibe is doing it and also Movitech uh, have started out and we have had a lot of discussions. We have been over in America because another important thing is for us not at the board, but uh, it, it is to look at the market. And I think we have seen pictures today where you can see that in Sweden we have like kind of um, uh, um, uh, not saturated, but uh, 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 what is it? Mogen market. 
a mature mature market and uh, in, in that case we are a lot of people working with it and, and we have like uh, competitors and, and you have your space while in America it is a juvenile market because like they have a lot of uh, gas and oil and they really are interested in, in uh, uh, ground source heat pumps and um, the population is so big and uh, like we said here before I cannot come to Dom's uh, area and start to compete but we don't have to compete instead we can work together and that is the last thing that you need to go that is the opportunity and I think the opportunity for us our little group came with the ID with Nibe and we got some information with movie tech and then we actually went to America a couple of companies uh, and we were visiting people and we were um, we were lucky because some of us had kids that had been exchange students we started to have a network and, and actually we got good friends through Ixpa meetings as well with people like Dom so we are not competing I think mm. in the future if we go to America small companies we will work together because we are not the same 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 but a little bit different but I think that is good we can do yeah. it better together thank you that was a very good answer cooperate or yes compete. And that is what ICHPA stands for, yep. so I'm a proud ICHPA member since one year ago. <laughs> so, <laughs> we have got a question from the public here about free cooling. And um, I would say I have a son living in Memphis. You see? In Memphis, <laughs> Tennessee. And I have tried to tell him that he needs a heat pump. But he does say that he needs no heat pump whatsoever. He needs free cooling instead. He needs to cool the house and then I tell them what's the problem well my problems are several uh, first they don't believe my the electricity bill they get because he's renting out flats to people uh, leasing out flats to people and they think that all his his refrigeration equipment is crap they, they, they think that it is crap and uh, that they have to pay too much for their electricity uh, because of that and uh, sometimes somebody goes out and steals this apparatus outside the house uh, or they even steal the copper pipes going into the house and that is quite cumbersome heating costs nothing because you have got a lot of natural gas that costs virtually nothing but cooling is expensive so therefore somebody in the audience here Mr. Wallström, who was it? Ah, <laughs> put that question. And now the question is, if we go to the US, shouldn't we really be more caring about cooling houses to the ground than heating? And then should it be the International Ground Sink Heat Pump Association instead of the ground source? <laughs> Source heat pump association. Very long question. Idea. Anybody has an idea about that? Well, I should. If it, when we talk about Memphis, you know, it's not that different from o Stillwater, Oklahoma, and actually there, the heating and cooling for a house is roughly balanced over the year. Mm -hmm. So we, I guess, we'd have to call it the heat sink and source pump association. <laughs> but of course, you do you do get better cooling, much better cooling performance from a ground source heat pump than you get from a standard air conditioning unit. You said those are crap. I'll just say if they aren't when they're installed, they are later on after they've been sitting out in the weather for 10 years. You know, their performance degrades over time. Mm -hmm. That's actually one of the great benefits of ground source heat pumps in the U.S. is that the equipment sits inside out of the weather. We also know of heat pumps from the 1970s that are still operational at least a few years ago. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and no outside piece of equipment is going to last that long. So. Mm -hmm. Th yeah. That's that's my comment. I don't think we should change the name, though. We just keep it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What about you? Do you have any ideas about that, John? A, a couple of things about that. I agree. Uh, what Jeff said earlier. You know, we we have um, both in the United States, but but more often than not, originally I lived in Ohio, and we had. Uh, we were heating dominant, but we had an awful lot of cooling we needed to do. And back then, before variable speed, 
equipment and that sort of thing. We were taught by expert manufacturers, etc., to size to the cooling load, make up the difference on that dominant heating load, usually with electric. Reason being, we had we, we need to dehumidify, we needed to get runtime out of the units, etc., because we also have a lot of latent load in a lot of places. Hmm. Where I live now in South Carolina in the coastal areas, uh, air source heat pumps are the most prevalent technology there in that salt water climate. Uh, the units are expected, much to the delight of the contractors, to last about eight years, then they, the outside unit needs to be replaced. We have a tremendous opportunity for ground source there but we have a little bit different design problem. Our, our water temperatures there, I, I don't know what the Celsius equivalent would be, would, but they're about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. That's our undisturbed ground temperature. 21. With, mm -hmm. with, with a huge cooling load and an awful lot of latent. So it, it, it yep. provides some interesting um, challenges, if you will, from the design side and the technology. But I would say in my case now, I'm all about that yeah. heat sink. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, of course, there is another thing we use here in Sweden, which we call free cooling. And I think the question here was actually uh, pointing at free, co free cooling, which means that, for instance, the new Karolinska hospital here has drilled the 160 holes, 250 meters deep, and they have a 2 megawatt cooling and 3 megawatt heating heat pump. And in the uh, summer, they, they uh, can use the holes, these 160 holes, as they are, because they have cooled them off during winter and during spring, and then the whole ground is very cold. And then they can use, they just pump the, the uh, working fluid from the holes directly to the to uh, panels and cool the whole hospital by that. Could, is that used in the US free cooling without any cooling machine at all? Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of any significant systems. You, you have to keep in mind that other than perhaps the Pacific Northwest, uh, west of the Cascades, we have very little climate that, and well, say down in California too, but we have very little climate that actually matches the Swedish climate. So even in South Dakota or Minnesota, where many Swedes emigrated to, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, have very severe winters, but they also have very hot and, hu summer. and varying degrees of humidity in the summer. So even up there, there's, it's difficult to do free cooling. In, pl in the southern tier states, uh, John said the undisturbed ground temperature there is 21 degrees Celsius in Stillwater, Oklahoma, it's about 17 degrees Celsius. It's just too warm to do free cooling a significant amount of the summer. Mm -hmm. You just, yeah, you could do it if you wanted to put in the extra system yeah. for the first month or something for and May. I have actually <laughs> been uh, with a company that installed free cooling in a house outside Stockholm here, using 17 degrees in the incoming uh, working fluid to the to the, and that, that it was heated to 20, whereas the rooms were kept at 22, 24. But there were huge heat exchanges, right. of course, in such cases. On the other hand, the cooling was completely free. And it didn't condense either, because the pipes were kept above the uh, uh, condensation temperature in the air, so you didn't need any insulation. We, where we come from, we would consider no condensation a failure. Because <laughs> it would mean that the house, it would be very humid ah, if I you didn't condense. Yeah, so yeah, we, I see. we mm. feel pretty strongly we got to get the water out oh, of yes. the air. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Jeff, John, and Mark, boreholes are normally groundwater filled in Sweden, whereas they are grouted in the US. Will, will that change here or there? Will it change in the US or will, it, will you start making less uh, grouted holes and start with groundwater filled holes? Or will we in Sweden ever start with grouted holes to a large extent? Uh, I don't see the United States going to less grouting. I, I see it. I, my feeling would be we will grout more and more. We still have states that don't require bottom to top grouting. Some, uh, South Carolina being one of them, they just uh, 
require a 20-foot bentonite plug at the top of a borehole. However, uh, IGSPA standards and now the CSA binational that I mentioned earlier, CSA 448, are all coming, converging on bottom to top grouting. And it's, and I would guess that Kevin McRae from Groundwater Association would be a proponent of that. It's, it's all about protection of the, the aquifers, of course. But then that leads to the challenge of thermal performance and the different Grouts we're seeing in the, the development. What, what what are your thoughts, Jeff? Um, I, I agree completely. I don't think we're going to go to groundwater filled boreholes, except for that part of the country where we have standing column wells. That's a kind of groundwater filled borehole. Um, as to what's going to happen in Sweden, uh, I don't know. I cannot. May, yeah. <laughs> maybe, you know, if you have a lot of concern about environmental regulations, it, it could get pushed that way mm -hmm. to grouting, but. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. I think Tony can answer, so yeah. please, go ahead. Or at least I want to say something. So, uh, I think like, if, if you take the history in Sweden, we are a country, uh, no, no oil and gas, but super much nice water, we thought. And uh, everybody are allowed to drill a water well. And uh, even today, it's uh, lower regulations about drilling a water well than an energy well, uh, borehole. So I think in Sweden, uh, we... Um, we didn't care so much. We were happy, but if you would take the neighbor Denmark, they are very afraid of uh, polluting the water. Their geology is, uh, if you put something on the surface, it's going down to the groundwater. So they have a lot of regulations. And I think in Sweden, uh, the drillers, we are mainly uh, magmatic uh, bedrock drillers. We are, from, uh, we are taking the um, drilling uh, technology from mining industry while in uh, Norway and in the US, they are taking the drilling technology from uh, oil drilling, where you are working with uh, mud and you are used to work with cement and bentonite. So there have be been a lot of discussions in Sweden because now we understand that we have to protect our nice pure water. And uh, a couple of cities in Sweden, mainly in the south, they have uh, regulations that all wells or boreholes have to be grouted. And, um, and then we raise the question because if you want to protect the groundwater and you grout and you do a crappy work, then you have not done anything. You, then you actually have a, a bad wound in the future. Uh, but if you do a good grout, then you have like uh, healed the wound. And I think that is something that we in Sweden can take from America and learn. Maybe we should go there and train how to grout and, and take the technology to Sweden to help uh, our authorities to understand that it's not polluting the water. We grout and we can do it well. So I think it's something that we can learn a lot of. We have uh, in the south, we have had uh, friends from Norway that have helped us because they are also a mud driller company, uh, country. So we need to learn a lot about grouting. Mm -hmm. And I think it's good. I think it's come to Sweden. Yeah. How easy will it be for my son, Jeff, to drill a hole in Memphis? How many permits does he have, need to have? What contacts does he have to pay for that? Does he have to have consultants making uh, geological surveys? Uh, what, what kind of barriers will be set up if he tries to do that? Well. John may know more about Tennessee. John? I'm not sure. Maybe. Do you, do you I've, uh, I don't, we've not done any work in Tennessee, although there's some good expo contractors from that area. Uh, I've not heard that it's any more difficult there than anywhere else. It, it, most states uh, that we've worked in uh, have a state uh, requirement for a hole drilled that's based on water well regulations that may have to do with which portion of the hole is crowded, et cetera, whether any special casing considerations. Uh, it's kind of a long-winded way of saying I don't believe it would be very difficult at all. It would, it would be a matter of finding a contractor who is licensed. I will tell state. him. I will tell and, him. Uh, okay. Thank you. And, and, and in fact, I imagine that Tony would Form a company there if he can get enough of those drilled, right? Yeah. yeah. 
Martin, we heard here that you should join <coughs> rather than compete. And your company has come in and bought water furnace or, uh, and other companies as well. And it seems to me like you are joining more than competing also in that way that you come in with. And then it's a question of, uh, are we exporting Swedish technology to the US? Or, or is it more business as usual in both countries? I think we are, there is a long term technology exchange. Uh, however, in the short run, yes, uh, we don't interfere too much uh, with each other's uh, development departments. We do share what we have and they take what they like, but we're not pushing them. Mm -hmm. Most of them to use our technology and nice version. Mm -hmm. so we pick up some good ideas that they are using and they are picking up some good ideas from us. So that's how we work. However, I think that um, this industry, like many other industries, we stand in for a technology revolution, really. I think we've talked about IT and IT solutions and uh, smartphones and cars and uh, things like that. But so far, it has not really exploded in our type of equipment. But I'm not sure it will. And I think, I mean, uh, Jose told, showed us some of the thermal response test methods for the future, the geoball. And the other interesting thing, new things, it's, it's all IT. Uh, we have introduced uh, what we call the new uplink, where you can connect to your to your heat pump and, and monitor the heat pump, also control the heat pump. So far, this is only on a, I say, minor scale, but this will just revolutionize the the, uh, the complete technology. This will become day-to-day uh, -day business, and then we will learn a whole lot more and, and, and Jeff will get all the data he would like to get on the data and he'll get it. So that's going to be good for the university as well. We don't have to do it. <laughs> I have made the heat pump programs for NIBA, so I know you can drown in that data. I am <laughs> sure you will. I think you got a question okay. back there. Okay, was it a question? Ah. Hello, yes. Hi, um, I just wonder with, I have no idea how it is in the States, but I'm just thinking with all the regulations that you have in Sweden, we use the groundwater and aquifers as uh, energy barriers. Are you allowed to, or carriers, are you allowed to use the groundwater in the States and aquifers, or is it a regulation that you're only allowed to use the rock? Um, no, you, well, uh, certainly we use uh, some places, uh, what we call open loop systems, where you pump the water out directly and use it. Um, yeah. The first thing you should know, maybe uh, John alluded to this, is that every state in the U.S. has its own regulatory authority. Okay. So it's hard for me to give a general answer, but if anybody in this room could give a general answer to your question, it's Kevin McRae, who's sitting right there in the second row. And maybe, Jose, if you could bring the microphone up, I'm going to put Kevin on the spot. But... <laughs> the... Jeff's right. Every state has its own regulations, and, and actually in some of the states they defer to what we call the county level, a much more local level in terms of regulation, and even some cities have some regulations on top of what counties and states do. As far as uh, the thermal impact, uh, Jeff started to describe, we do what we call open loop systems. We used to call them pump and dump. We don't like that term. Pump and return, we prefer. Uh, but it requires in certain jurisdictions, if you take from the ground but return to a surface system, you have to get a surface water discharge permit. And those can be very difficult to obtain because of the thermal impact going to a, a stream that has an ecosystem in it. Um, as far as um, heating up groundwater, there is a temperature change, but if the groundwater is moving through, at a fairly good pace. The temperature probably isn't going to have an impact. 
uh, and they do try to on an open loop system oftentimes they will configure them so that they can uh, use one of the wells in the winter as the uh, water source a reversing kind of configuration and then there are in the eastern part of the United States where it's hard rock drilling you do find more standing column wells uh, where they're using uh, a single well to uh, withdraw the water as well as to return the water but that's not very common at all it's, it is happening in the hard rock areas but by large measure most of the systems installed are closed loop uh, vertical configuration there are horizontal streams etc but it's primarily that but in terms of a, a temperature impact there really doesn't seem to be any regulatory uh, concern um, it becomes a, a design question in terms of of the system's performance in terms of separation of the the two uh, boreholes Does that makes sense thank you very much All you it makes right. big sense really um, <laughs> I had the last question here actually. It says, how do you think an organization like IGSPA can promote networking and business opportunities between the countries? As amps are blinking here now, I think we will leave that question till tonight over a glass of beer and see in practical form how that question can be answered. Thank you so much for your uh, for your attention to this um.